but I love this service. And today, I've, it's always fun to have Mike Erickson share. You just never know what's going to happen with Mike. But I kind of know, and you guys, are, you guys get to have a little treat today, and you'll see what I mean or, yeah, when he gets up. So come on up here, Mike. Everybody welcome Mike Erickson to come up and share this morning, this afternoon. This afternoon. You good? Absolutely. You good? You yeah, good? You got it? Okay. we're good. So thank you for having me. It's exciting to be here. Um, I'm glad to get to be part of this, um, this uh, pulpit group where we get to come up here and we get to share and we get to move on our gifts. And as God is leading us, it's just exciting to be part of that. And I'm, I'm just thinking of Christmas. Um, sometimes Christmas goes so fast, and I, I just sometimes I like to enjoy it. And sometimes, because I like so many Christmas movies here. Anybody like Christmas movies? You know, when it's that time of year, they're just a lot of fun, right? Yeah. Christmas movies. And sometimes Christmas goes so fast, I don't have time to watch all the Christmas movies I want to. So sometimes I expand my Christmas watching of the movies into January. Um, but one... Um, one of my favorite classics is A Christmas Carol with Scrooge in there. Anybody know? Most people know Ebenezer Scrooge, right? And The Christmas Carol in our house, the version that we watched a few times was Mickey Mouse in the Disney Christmas Carol. You know, you got Scrooge there. Time is money. You know, with, with uh, Scrooge there, this guy basically worships money. Money is his master, basically, in, in this show. And then if, if we go to the next picture, see, he's got all his coins there. He's counting because that's more important to him than anything else. He even, um, basically, he lets money convince him that he wants it more than anything else. Money tells him that he needs it more than any relationship, more than any friendship, more than being nice to people, more than even true joy is this money thing he just wants to hold on to. And he holds on to it through this whole film, right? If you know the story of Christmas Carol, that's Scrooge, right? He's just, he's just a curmudgeon, and he loves his money. But what the story does is they have the ghost of Christmas past, and they go to Scrooge's past, and then they explain why Scrooge is the way he is. And then those of us watching the film go, oh, that's why he's so mean. I all of a sudden don't hate him so much anymore, because I understand now why he is the way he is, why, he, um, has, why, money is, why he's a slave to money. So it, it, it has a you know, nice story, and it's, and it's good that it gives us the backstory so we can have empathy for Scrooge. But, but we have a backstory on this planet, why things are messed up, why sometimes we're messed up, because none of us are perfect, right? And there's a reason for that. And there's a good reason for that, but it doesn't have much to do with us personally, as much as it has to do with Adam and Eve and the garden and in the beginning of the world. See, in the beginning, the world was created perfect. And it was perfect with Adam and Eve there. So we have this perfect planet, and we have Adam and Eve, and, and uh, we have God and Adam and Eve here. See, we got Adam. There's Adam, here's Eve, right? And then there's God, and they're hanging out together, and everything's great because it's the beginning. Yay, we love everything. Everything's all good and to, uh, great. And then something happened that changed everything because God told Adam, he said, Adam, see this tree here? Do not eat it. Okay, don't worry about it. God, I got this. It's fine. God, I got things. So then the serpent came down and deceived Eve. And then Eve showed the fruit to Adam. So Eve was deceived, and after she was deceived, she bit that fruit. And then being deceived, she showed it to Adam and said, hey, you should have some. And Adam said, yeah, sounds like a good idea. And Adam, <laughs> Adam let, let uh, the jury understand and the evidence show that Adam bit the fruit in complete disobedience. And he was not deceived like Eve was. So after that happened, after they bit into this uh, fruit that God told them not to, it wrecked everything, and they no longer had relationship with God, and God didn't move, but we as a people moved, and we became separated, oops, separated from God. Right? So there's us now separated from God, and there's actually a large... Uh, division, barrier that separates us from God at this time called sin, right? 
So after that, this whole world has become broken and fallen, and we now live in a broken world because of that piece of history. And that explains why there's so much dysfunction. That explains why we don't get things right. It explains why uh, stuff is messed up, why we can be messed up. So now we live in this fallen world. And let's read uh, the scriptures now, starting in Romans uh, chapter 5. It says, when Adam's sin, sin entered the world, Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given. But it was not counted as sin because there was not any, yet any law to break. So still everyone Still everyone died. From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit command of God as Adam did. So everybody is guilty. Even if you don't obey, disobey a specific command, you're still guilty. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> so, so if we go to jump back a little bit to Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. So we're all in this together. We're all dysfunctional. Yay, right? So we were born in this planet as sinners, whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not, we all get to take part of this. And what happens is, because we're sinners doomed to death, we naturally, our natural bend is to sin. And we start to become things that not God, that was never His plan. He never created us to become these sinful things or develop this behavior or pattern. It should never have been part of our life on this earth. That was never God's plan. But the sin nature has enslaved us, and now we have to follow it. And the sin nature is a harsh master. It's a harsh master, and we're its slave now. Look here in Romans chapter 6, verse 16. It said, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? So because of the sin nature, we have to obey the sin. So you can be a slave to sin because of our sin nature, which leads to death. And then jump here to um, John, the book of John, chapter 8, starting with verse 31. Jesus said to, his peop said to the people who believed in him, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. But we are descendants of Abraham, they said. We have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you'll be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. And this leads to our first point. The truth about life is that we were born slaves to sin. We're all slaves to sin and separated from God, and we have to obey our masters, which is the sin, this world, the devil, everything but good things that God wanted us to. And we have to do what, obey and do whatever they tell us. And it may be an addiction, or it might be money, or pride, or a number of things that... Uh, tell us what to do and when to do it. And there are horrifying examples of slavery all throughout history and even today about how horrible this is. But it, if you remember in the Old Testament, th there's a picture of slavery we can look at because the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And I believe there's a picture of them being slaves to the Egyptians, doing what the Egyptians told them. And the Israelites were slaves for 400 years. 400 years. In those years, they had to do whatever the Egyptians told them to do. Look here in uh, the book of Exodus, chapter 1, starting with verse 11. It says, So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. So the Israelites are slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build the cities of Python and Ramses and as supply centers for the king. But the more the Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, and the more alarmed the Egyptians became. So the Egyptians worked the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and make bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all their demands. They, their masters were the Egyptians, and they were ruthless, as, as we just read. They did everything, they had to do everything the Egyptians told them. They didn't have a choice. It was do this or be beaten. Do this or suffer and possibly, quite possibly die. And um, is there, I believe we have another slide. 
Yeah, that, oh, they're just the harsh masters. They're beating an Israelite. There's an Egyptian beating an Israelite because of how harsh they were. And they basically would tell them, you will work as long as we tell you. You will work as hard as we tell you. You will work every day because we say so. You will kill your babies when we tell you. You will do what we say. And when we say it, because we own you. That's what it means to be a slave to a harsh master. You have to do what they say, and if you don't, you suffer. I was a slave to sin. And no matter what I did, I could not get away from it. It was every day I had to do it when it told me to, and I hated it. It had become my master. It was very depressing, and it was a very bleak moment of my life. Everything looked just dark all the time because the sin uh, basically controlled my life. It controlled my happiness. I remember one time I'd given in to the sin again for the billionth time. I was so upset I cried out in anguish and I just ripped my shirt in half. I was so upset. And the truth about this life just sounds very depressing, doesn't it? It's very depressing if you think about it. And for many people it is depressing. And maybe it's depressing for you today because you have something that's just eating on you and there's nothing you can do to get away from it. But there's good news because God did not intend for us to stay there. Look at these following scriptures in John. John 8. A slave is not a permanent member of the family, but a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. And here... In this, in this uh, verse, they're speaking about God's Son, Jesus, setting you free. And then I'm going to jump to another scripture again, Romans chapter 6, verse 16. But I'm going to include the rest of the scripture now that I left out earlier. So some of you knew the whole verse, it might have drove you crazy. But this is the importance of reading scripture in its entirety. So when you read the Bible, read it in its entirety. So it says, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death. That's where we left off. This is the other part, the good news. Or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. We are born to sin. We are born to worldly, fleshly desires. But if we want to live right, we must belong to God, hang out with God, be part of God, and believe in Him. And because as we, as we belong to Him and hang out with Him, it's easier to believe in Him. And as we believe Him and walk with Him, He'll start fixing our behavior. He'll start fixing the things wrong with us as we spend more time with Him in that relationship. So this leads to the second point, which is the truth about life is that we can be set free by Jesus. So there's two truths there. We're born sinners on this side. But over here, we can be set free by Jesus and we don't have to stay there. Because Adam's sin made everyone a slave to sin. God looked down, had compassion on us. There was nothing that could correct that sin issue. It was an issue, and it's always been an issue, and there was nothing that could do it. Until Jesus came down, and Jesus, what he did for us, was he actually built a bridge for us. When he died on the cross, he built that bridge for us to be able to come back and speak with God again. And the bridge was the shed blood on the cross. Because of the cross, we can be set free and become part of family, part of church family, part of God's family. And in a similar context, the Israelites were born in slavery to the Egyptians. A lot of them were. But the Israelites were also set free by God, just like we were. Let's read this part in Exodus chapter 12. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel together and said to them, Go pick out a lamb or a young goat for each of your families and slaughter the Passover animal. Drain the blood into a basin, then take a bundle of hyssop branches and dip it into the blood. Brush the hyssop across the top and sides of the door frames of your houses. And no one may go out through the door until morning, for the Lord will pass through the land and strike 
uh, to strike down the Egyptians, but when he sees the blood on the top and sides of the door frame, the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. So they had to put lamb's blood on their doorposts or the death angel that was coming would have killed them. And I believe there's a slide. That's probably what it looked like when they took the branches. They would cover the blood here, here, and over here where he's standing. But they would, it would be all uh, three sides there is what they would cover with the blood. So now we're going to continue in Exodus 12, but we're going to jump down to verse 28. So the people of Israel did just as the Lord had commanded through Moses and Aaron. And that night at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn sons in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn son of the prisoner in the dungeon, even the firstborn of their livestock were killed. And now let's jump down to verse 51. On that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt like an army. So God brought them out of slavery that day. That's the power of the Lord, bringing them out of slavery back then, bringing us out of our slavery today. God set them free by His mighty power. The Egyptians finally let the Israelites go after their firstborn was killed. This is similar to how God delivered us with His firstborn that was killed for us. All we have to do is accept what Jesus has done for us. And the Israelites were saved from the angel of death by having their door covered by the blood of the Lamb. And we are set free by being covered by the blood of Jesus, who is our Lamb. He's the Lamb of God. Because of God's firstborn Son, I've been set free from a lot of things. I've been called God's Son. Because of the shed blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, I am no longer a slave to sin. And I told you about the sin that I was trapped in for a long time. I could not get away from it. I cried in anguish and ripped my shirt because it was so agonizing. And I just hated it. And one day I was so upset again at, at this sin, I just punched a hole right through my wall at my house and left a big hole there that I had to fix later. But I broke down and started crying again. And, and this time the difference was I gave more of it to God and with all this pain, I started releasing all this pain. Even though it wasn't fun, I started releasing this pain to God and letting Him take up the pain. Letting Him take up my burden. And as I cried, the blood of Jesus washed over me, cleansed me, and held my burdens for me. And it was a long process to go through this pain, to get this hurt out. So I quit sinning because the sin over here was linked to this hurt over here. So God had to clean all that mess up, and it was a process but God did it, and God delivered me from it. And I no longer had to obey that sin. And every day I would renew my mind into God's truth, and I'd have to read God's truth. And I had to listen to God tell me who He said I was, and turn off this world, and turn off what they were trying to tell me. In Christ, I was a new creation. I was God's adopted son. And that's just part of the things God has done in my life. God has brought me a long ways. I can tell you from the person who I was when I first got saved, God told me I was called to be a pastor. But if you looked at me then, you'd say, there's no way this guy should ever be a pastor. Now, here today I am preaching, and I'm going to get interviewed for my license this month to be a pastor. And it's all glory be to God, and it's exciting. Some of you today are allowing this world or sin or the devil to tell you who you are. And you do not have to listen. You don't have to obey that sin. You don't have to obey any addiction or attitude or your money because you're no longer a slave to any of that. You're no longer a slave to fear. You're no longer a slave to lust. You're no longer a slave to any of your hurts or your hang-ups. You don't have to obey any vice ever again. And if you've never been set free, it starts with a relationship with Jesus Christ. It starts with saying yes to Jesus and accepting Him. And once you do, He'll start the process of cleansing you. I've heard a saying before. It says, Jesus catches the fish before He cleans them. <laughs> See, so then once, once you meet Jesus and accept Him, 
you'll be set free and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth of Jesus Christ. So, when you came in here, most of you should have gotten an envelope. Everyone should have gotten an envelope. Did everybody get an envelope? Who, who didn't get an envelope? Anybody? Raise your hand and then the usher will come by and give you an envelope. Everybody needs an envelope. If you already opened the envelope, that's okay. Can I have 10 of them? You can have none of them. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kurt Shafee. So, so go ahead, get, get the envelope out. And if you want to, you can start opening up the envelope now and look at what it is what it is, and you, maybe you want to show your neighbor what it is. Everyone got an envelope? If you already have one, please don't take another one, because some of you are finding out now what it is. So it should be, I'm going to spill the beans here, so it should be a $5 bill in that envelope. Once you open it, there should be $5 in there, right? And sure it's $5. And maybe some of you, that's a good amount of money. Maybe some of you, it's not a good amount of money. But we're giving away this money because we no longer want to be a slave to money and have money tell us what to do. So I want to have God tell me how to spend my money. So, I'm, so we are giving you $5 to spend however you want to. But if I'm set free by God and listen to Him, He will guide me how to spend my money. And again, honestly, you can do with it what you want. It's your money to have. But imagine what you can do with that money if you decide not to be a slave to that money and listen when it tells you how to spend it. Maybe you buy somebody coffee. Maybe you can pay somebody to say, I'll give you five bucks if you let me pray for you. Maybe you can add that money plus some of yours to buy them a meal or take them out somewhere. That... Um, but you can use the five, you should use the five dollars however God leads you to use it. Because God has a plan for that money and a way for you to use it. And then once you do that, we want to hear about it. Please tell us your story. How did God use you in this five dollars? And then we want to hear about it because we want to have your testimony out for everybody to hear and share your testimony about how God used you in this $5. So if you have a sweet testimony with this money, please contact me or the church office, or you can even talk to Kurt about it, because we want, it, we want to hear those stories about God using it and changing our community. Because imagine what would happen if we were no longer slaves to sin, for real. Um, we would be set free, and we could walk in the purpose that God has laid out for us. And this is just a step to do that with. Because God has a plan for all of us here. Maybe it's not preaching. Maybe it's the tech booth. Or maybe it's kids. Or maybe it's youth. Maybe it's fixing things up around the church. It's something. God has a purpose for you. You're not here for any accident. So imagine what this community will look like when we allow God to make our schedule for us when we spend time with God and stop listening to what that sin is telling us to do but live in freedom of what God tells us to do so just think about that for a while what you want to do with your five dollars let us know and just think about all the things God can do through us when we move as a church family thank you for your time this morning today is actually mission Sunday and we are going to have a video for you that's going to show you the missionaries that uh, we're supporting through, um, through the offering. So please watch this video on the missionaries. Hello, this is Jonathan and Sarah Griffiths. We met in England, were married in the United States, and raised three sons there, David, Charlie, and Ransom. We're both Foursquare ministers serving with Foursquare Missions International in Great Britain, which is the place I was born. Our goal as missionaries here in England align with Foursquare's four-stage model. That is to reach the unreached, raise up new leaders, plant new churches, and start new movements. Our special focus is on reaching the unreached. Our mission is to participate in fulfilling the Great Commission through reaching the unreached people groups in the cultural capital of London. 
We see this happening by the launching of a new generation of British disciple makers who are committed to living life together on mission in their own neighborhoods. By establishing a strong network of missional communities, we believe we can see the transformation of towns, cities, counties, and nations. So we're needing to see where can we reach British people with the good news of Jesus. So what's happening here, where we are? Most of the families at the schools don't attend church. We have family members who don't believe in God and our neighbors who are content to live their lives without seeking out God at all. What do they have in common? Most of them, nearly all of them, have not had any serious, meaningful conversations about Jesus with a Christian before. Since we moved here, we've been able to have ongoing and meaningful conversations with people about Jesus. Um, we have friends who have told us that uh, they've never heard anyone talk about Jesus like he's a real person before. Um, others have said that uh, most of their conversations with friends are very surface and they find it um, interesting and refreshing that we want to talk about deeper things in life. In January 2017, shortly after enrolling our boys at St. John's Primary School, we were approached about starting a Sunday school to serve the school community. In September, we launched Journey Kids. Journey Kids is a place where we get to share about the person and work of Jesus Christ and share good news with families that call Cheltenham their home. It's something that the diocese, the Gloucestershire diocese, have been talking about for a while. What they want is for children, and particularly children who don't go to church for whatever reason. Some children find church intimidating. They're, perhaps their families may find it intimidating. But the diocese wants schools, Church of England schools, to be able to provide their children and families from their community opportunities to gently explore the Christian faith. And this is just a fantastic way of being able to do it. We have two big goals at the moment. One of them is based around Journey Kids in terms of increasing the amount of children attending and even multiplying that. Our second goal is establishing our first missional community within the next 12 months in our own neighborhood. We believe that as we learn to multiply these missional communities across the districts of our own town, we'll be laying out the blueprint for what will be effective in reaching the people and the nations in the city of London. One of the most exciting things is that unchurched families are participating. We even have um, volunteers who are helping out that aren't part of a church and have no faith, but because of our relationship, they are willing to come along and help with Journey Kids. It's just amazing. We've been able to build deep relational connections with people. We've talked about Jesus with Muslims, with Mormons, with Buddhists, with the unchurched and the de-churched, with atheists and agnostics, with people from all different social economic backgrounds. And it's a privilege to do that. One of my favorite stories happened just across the road from here. It was several months ago, and Joel, a friend of mine, a worship leader at the local Salvation Army Church, we were out prayer walking as we tend to do on Thursdays. And just over the road here, we met a man named Philip. He was in need of prayer. He was sick. He was uh, just struggling with physical issues. But before we prayed for him, we got to share the gospel. And in this remarkable moment of Holy Spirit-led ministry, this man, Philip, gave his heart to Jesus. We then prayed for him and found that God restored movement to his hand. He lost movement and, and had swelling issues in his hand, and God restored his hand. Over many months now, we've continued to speak to Philip. Uh, he's a homeless man um, who, who has just actually finished rehab and has been committing his life in prayer, asking God to do things in his life. And it's just a wonderful privilege to get to share Jesus with whoever he sends us to in this town. A recent survey showed that 53% of British adults now register as having no religion or no faith. Meanwhile, other research has shown that sharing the gospel with children aged 4 to 10 is the most effective time for reaching them. Britain, though facing a gospel crisis, is poised for a fresh move of missionary work. Indeed, the nation that launched a wave of missionaries for decades and decades is now in need of receiving missionaries. And we are so thankful to have been sent, to have been commissioned by Foursquare Missions International to be a part of restoring the British to Christ and through that, reaching the nations.
So that is our, yes, they're very cool. They're, I, John and Sarah, I've got to hang out with them several times at the various conferences we have and stuff, and they're just the neatest, just real people. And they, when you sit and talk to them, they're, they're very genuine, and they, they, they have a favor about them, and they're just having a lot of cool breakthroughs. So ushers, you can go ahead and receive that. that uh, so this offering will go to support their mission down there. They used to be pastors out in Seattle area, and that's how I met them and became friends with them. And then they felt called, and God made a way for them to move to back to the UK, and now they're missionaries over there. So we've been talking for several months, if not a couple of years, um, about how we could support them. And, you know, as, as Mike talked about this whole idea of the gospel and, and freedom and, and uh, Jesus and the, the, the gospel— is him coming and setting us free from the slave. We don't have to bow to the slave masters. Jesus is the best master because he's good and faithful and, and uh, he provides and protects on this life, but also eternally. So he's a good master. But there's a lot of people walking out there that don't know this. There's people I talk to all the time, and I'm sure you do too. You see it out there. And God doesn't want us just to hoard this information and know that, oh, good, I'm saved, and Jesus loves me, and I love him, and we have a great relationship, but I'm not going to tell anybody. And that's why we do this monthly mission. We try to bring in missionaries who are on the front lines and doing this stuff. Not obviously, we, we all want to be sharing our faith in our homes, in our families, and in our life, um, in our communities, and so on and so forth. But we like to try with this once a month, Mission Sunday, we like to do, in the 12 months, we like to do four of them that are local, so right here in Bismarck, Mandan, and then four of them that are in the nation, somewhere outside of Bismarck and Mandan, somewhere in the, in the country, and then four outside of our, our borders in other uh, parts of the world. In March, if you were here oh, a couple of years ago, we had a guy named Ted Ulbrich who is in Cambodia, and that guy, he is a, he's incredible. He's, I, I don't know how else to say it, but he's going to be back here in March. It's going to be awesome to have him here. Also, if you were here last year, uh, Super Bowl Sunday, we had a guy named Steve Thompson who played for the New York Jets with Joe Namath when they won the Super Bowl. I just talked to him last week, and it looks like he's going to be back this year again on Super Bowl Sunday in three weeks because of his schedule. It looks like we're going to be able to make it work for him to be back, and he's got some incredible stories. And uh, So anyway, I invite a friend to that for sure. That's on Super Bowl Sunday. But So this is why we do Mission Sundays. We'd like to team with guys like like Steve Thompson, the football player, he's out traveling all over t sharing his story, and he'll come and share here. The Griffiths are out sharing their story, and we're, we get to extend ourselves beyond our own community and our own little world when we support these different uh, missions. And so thank you guys for, so much for doing that. And thank you, Mike, very much for your willingness. Yes, coming up and sharing. And blessing us with five bucks. And you guys, that five bucks that you hold, it's not from the church. That's from him and his wife's pocket. They prayerfully felt like God said they're supposed to do this out of their own pocket to bless you guys so that we can bless others. So it's pretty cool that they're, they, they, they're living what they said. So anyway, with that said, we're going to pray over the Connect cards here. And so if you guys would extend your hand, we will pray over these Connect cards. God, thank you so much for your freedom that we don't have to fear the great enemy, death. That you have died on the cross for us so that we don't have to be afraid of death anymore. We know you've got it all wrapped up and when we get to heaven and see you face to face, it's gonna be incredible. And we look forward to that day. But in the meantime, we got all kinds of issues and you know it, there's a battle going on. So thank you for this weapon, this tool called prayer that we can agree together with one voice put our prayer requests down and bring them to you and ask for you to intervene to do what we can't do. And God, we are so grateful that we can trust you with every one of these situations, every relationship, every situation, God. You, you are faithful and we'll do our best to commit them to you and to pray and to watch you move and when you break through to make sure we give you the the praise and the glory and the honor that's due your name. So we even do that in advance, God. You are faithful. You've proven yourself faithful, and you will continue to prove yourself faithful. So again, we just pray for each one of these connect cards, God. Pour out your spirit in them and through them so it'll build your kingdom and glorify Jesus in the process. And we trust it all to you in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, 
Amen. All right, let's stand together. We'll close with our series verse. If you have a prayer request, there's be a prayer team right over here. Don't leave without getting prayer. Prayer, 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 prayer is powerful and awesome. If you um, need a Bible, we got free Bibles. If you want some others, if you want to get water baptism or whatnot, there's a bunch of information over here for next steps over there. If you want to get uh, meet with a pastor or one of our care folks that walk people through stuff, you can go online and uh, set up an appointment in order to call the church office, and we'd love to do that. And then last, if you want to get involved somewhere, there's lots of places. Go online and let us know, and we'll help you get plugged in. So with that said, let's read our series verse. Here we go. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. God bless you guys. Have a great week and go Vikings.